there was always music in my house. And it was either jazz, jazz music. Uh, it, it was either AM radio that my mom used to leave on 24 hours a day because she thought it kept away the burglars because <laughs> I lived in a bad neighborhood. So it was either like, you know, jazz, uh, bossa nova, uh, Broadway musicals, classical music. And then I had my, my older brother's record collection, which was nothing like the music that I was hearing in the house. I gravitated toward his re record collection because of the, the, of the, the album covers. You know, I was only about four or five years old. And so, you know, the visual aspect of the album covers really, really attracted me to to, to them. And I, can, I vividly remember th those album covers because they're, they're album covers that everyone knows today. Like, you know, Are You Experienced, uh, the first Jeff Tull album, the first uh, Grateful Dead album, Quicksilver Messenger Service, even, even Black Sabbath Paranoid. And, and so... That that music was in my house, but I didn't I, I didn't hear it though because it, it was it was my brother's stuff, and he and you know he would just go on his own and listen to it, and I would catch snippets of it here and there, but I was mostly interested in the album covers. It was interesting because like one day I, I wandered into the living room where all the album covers were, and I saw this case on the floor. I looked at it. I was like, "What's this?" and of course, you know, being just curious, I walked over to it, opened up the latches, and opened it up, and it's a red SG, Gibson SG guitar. And I was like, wow, cool. And I remember taking it out and putting it on and plugging it into an amp and just hitting a note, bong, and it being a lot louder than I expected and being freaked out, <laughs> thinking that, oh, I'm going to get in trouble. Someone's going to hear me. And taking it off, putting it back into the case, closing it, and putting it in, in, in the spot I found it in. And that was like the very first, my very first uh, sort of uh, experience with an electric guitar. And literally, I had to, be, had to have been like four or five years old. So fast forward 10 years, I'm walking down the hallway, high school, you know, I have my little like, tape recorder, I'm probably listening to like Jeff Beck Wired or, or you know, uh, Wheels of Fire, Cream, or like, I don't know, Electric Ladyland or something crazy like that. And I saw this commotion off to the side, these older kids. And I remember looking, and one of them pulled out a case of Strat. And when I saw the Strat, I was like, wow, it looks like a hot rod. And then it got me thinking. And I remember that day running back to the house and just thinking, wow. That guitar looked really cool. And then getting the album covers of the, of the stuff I was listening to and looking at all the guitars that were on the, on the covers of the albums, and particularly Kiss Alive, that picture of Ace Freely holding his guitar. But I thought, is he holding his guitar inside out? And he was. If you, ever, if you look at that, he's actually holding his guitar inside out. And so the idea got into my, my head of trying to play guitar. And I remember uh, trading... Uh, a Kiss album. I had a Kiss album, and all the money I had, <laughs> all the money I had in my life, which is ten bucks, <laughs> and trading it for this really cheap catalog guitar. Growing up, my family didn't have any money. Uh, I didn't have enough money to even buy a guitar case. I used to have to put a, a case into a, a garbage bag if I wanted to go anywhere. And so the very first time I got a wah pedal, it was because uh, a, a relative of mine passed away and I got a small inheritance of like maybe $150 or something, you know? And I took that money, I bought a wah pedal. And it was amazing because all of a sudden I, I felt like I was able to make sounds that Jimi Hendrix was making, but also sounds that Brian Robertson, the guy from Thin Lizzy, was making. You know, Pat Travers was making. Uh, you know, sounds that, that, that I was hearing on, on all these different uh, different albums. And I, I played that wall pedal literally for like months on end. It was just like always plugged in. I was always changing the battery. And it was just something I just loved. It was a great option when I got, you know, when I wanted to take my playing somewhere else and I wanted a, a real distinct change of sound and, and direction and attack. 
stepping on that wall and just finding a spot on that wall all of a sudden shifted my, my thinking and my playing instantly. And that's what I like about wall pedal. It shifts my playing and it shifts my thinking almost instantly. And um, it brings more stuff out. People say that, you know, uh, 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 using a wall pedal can be a crutch. And yeah, you know, yeah, it can be. And I'm certainly guilty of that. I'll admit it but only because I just love it so much. But, you know, the main reason I, I, I use it is because it inspires me and then it's like instant inspiration. And it doesn't matter if, if my amp's up to 10 or my amp's up to three, I have a clean sound, you know, dirty sound or whatever. The fact that I could step on that thing and then all of a sudden I'm in a different tonal spectrum, it's great. It, 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 forces, it forces my brain to the, the, the fill, fill in that, 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 that that change. My first real gu uh, guitar was a, a, a Strat, and um, uh, you know when I plugged the Strat in into the, the amp I had, I didn't get the fullness. You know, I didn't get you know the, 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 all the frequencies that I wanted to hear. And so I remember, because this was after the first Van Halen album, I remember getting a humbucker pickup. I, I think it's a Dimaggio Super Two pickup, and putting it in the bridge position. And not being quite, quite satisfied with the sound. I remember that I had a plan. I was going to work for six months, get enough money to, uh, 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 to, to trade in my Strat and uh, 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 an amount of money for a Gibson Flying V. Because I really liked Michael Schenker. I really liked his sound. And I realized that Gibson was probably what I was hearing on all those albums. I decided that, you know, I, I need to get, get a Gibson to get that, that sound. And so I, I remember showing up the music store, picking out a 1979 Gibson Flying V that was brand new and doing the trade in. And from that part, point on, I was in heaven. You know, all of a sudden my sound was fuller sounding. And uh, it it made me realize that the you know the, the the sound that I was looking for was based around humbucking pickups and that sound. And even though I was just totally into Jimi Hendrix and that kind of sound, you know, and Steve, and later on Steve Ray Vaughan, humbucking pickups were just my thing. It's, and it, it just it fit my style of playing. From there on. I, I had gotten this Gibson Flying V, and it was it was so great because it was the, it was the first time that I had a guitar that uh, I was able to like really just master, you know, from from, the, from you know, because Strats are you can do so much with a Strat, but I had so little experience with the guitar. I had I I, I, I didn't fully you know, know the, the strap potential, but with a Gibson Flying V, it was all obvious to me, you know, all the sounds were there that I wanted, the playability, the access, and, you know, the look. And, you know, for a kid, you know, playing a Flying V guitar, it's, it's like a big toy, you know? <laughs> and so I was just so happy. And then when I finally got a Marshall amp and plugged that Gibson into the Marshall amp, it was like, I was, it was complete. The sound that I was looking for was complete. And then I remember the band that I was in at the time, you know, the, the other guys in the band were seeing this transformation in sound. And then all of a sudden, the band I was in, we sounded different. You know, we sounded more full and it sounded closer to the sound that I was trying to get, which was this like a, a more aggressive hard rock sound that I wasn't hearing in a lot of American bands at all but I was hearing a lot in European bands and I wanted that sound and I wanted to take that sound and just like, you know, grab it and, and apply it to the music that I was playing with these other guys in the band that eventually was called Exodus. I realized that, that at some point after listening to a lot of rock radio that I liked loud, fast drums, distorted guitar, power chords, riffs, and you know, I just realized just recently that, that when I came to that decision, I was maybe 15 or 16 years old. I went to school and people were talking about these three guys I'd never heard of before. Pink Floyd, Jethro Tull, and Led Zeppelin. I was like, who are those guys? <laughs> you know, that's how naive I was. I remember just slowly getting into it. And then 
starting to listen to rock radio and in, in the late 70s rock radio really progressed and, and started getting just harder and harder until like around 1978 1979 they were playing all sorts of hard rock you know Aerosmith Cheap Trick ACDC Foreigner Patrick you know all that stuff was on the radio and it was great and I really could relate to what I was hearing, but it wasn't quite enough. It wasn't quite enough. It wasn't like fulfilling this 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 feeling in my chest and in my gut. And then I heard UFO. It was it had to be like 1978 or 79, 1979. And all of a sudden I heard something that was what I was looking for, which was something heavier and a little bit more extreme. And, a, and just a, 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 a little bit more aggressive than anything that was coming out of America. And when I discovered UFO, I also discovered a whole slew of other bands too that are coming out of Europe, Scorpions, Motorhead, and, and this thing called the New Wave of British Heavy Metal. And I started buying all this stuff, Motorhead's first two or three albums, and then a whole barrage of other stuff came, like the first Maiden album and Diamond Head, Angel Witch, Tigers of Pantang, all this stuff, and it was what I wanted to hear. I also realized, as I, you know, would talk to my friends and like talk to people who were music fans at my school, no one was listening to this stuff. And when I played a lot of it for a lot of my friends, they didn't want to hear it. They did not want to hear it, or they're just like visibly <laughs> irritated by it. So I started hanging out with the people who liked what I played for them. They're like, yeah, this is good, which ended up being, you know, our gang of people, Exodus. And because we all liked this, this special type of music, we became, we became a clique of friends. And I remember when it came time for Exodus, when we felt like we were ready to start playing clubs, we started going to a lot of the nightclubs in San Francisco and seeing these hard hard rock bands that are obviously influenced by Van Halen, Aerosmith, you know, you know, Led Zeppelin, all the contemporary bands. And they're okay, but we also started seeing like one or two bands that were influenced by the same stuff we were. And me and all the guys at Nexus, we would gravitate toward those bands. There was only like two or three of them in the beginning, but it grew to be like 15, 16 bands, whatever. Basically, that's how the, the heavy metal scene in San Francisco started off. We were just a band of people who listened to the same sort of music, and we start, uh, started to discover each other. And we discovered that, that, that there was this one guy named Ron Quintana who had a radio show on KUSF, college station in, in San Francisco and his, his radio show was called Rampage Radio and they played nothing but heavy metal, hard rock and the, uh, a new wave of British heavy metal. And that became our, our, our rallying point. Soon after that, a local club called the Old Waldorf decided to have Metal Mondays. So not only did we have a group of people who, who were like, uh, you know, who liked the same stuff, and not only did we have certain bands coming up, but we also had a radio station playing the stuff. And so that was the core of, of, of the scene. And everyone would talk to everyone else and, and say, hey, have you heard this band? Or have you heard this band? Or check out this demo of this band that's not even signed yet. We were hearing this, this music from, from Europe and hardly anyone knew about it. And, and we were, we were digesting it and and spinning out our ver version of it, which became, you know, the San Francisco thrash metal scene. Bands like Exodus and Metallica and all, all the other bands that came out of, out of the, uh, the Bay Area. But we were all pretty much doing the same thing. We we're taking these obscure bands from England, listening to it and being so inspired by it and turning out our own version of it and our own version being just really, really super popular. That basically was how the scene started. It was Rampage Radio, it was Heavy Metal Mondays at the Old Waldorf. It was going to uh, the import section of uh, all these record stores and it was, it was us recognizing other people who listened to the same stuff and the only way you could tell back then is if they had black leather jackets, because black leather jackets were not style back then. Black leather jackets and pins. 
And that's how you would know. At the very beginning of that scene, there's maybe 50 people. But by the end of that scene, and maybe, I don't know, whenever it stopped, maybe 90, 91, 92, it was practically the entire Bay Area. And that's how, that's how I believe, you know, heavy metal, what we know as heavy metal today, really just like grew out of, out of, out of, out of that scene in San Francisco and kind of spread all over the country. I remember we were just sitting out around one day and uh, the, the singer of Exodus, a guy named Paul Bailoff, was an absolute, absolute maniac. He walked into the rehearsal and said, Metallica, so heavy. They're so heavy. And I was like, Metallica. And I thought, what a great name. That's like the best name in the world, Metallica. That is the best name I think I've ever heard for a metal band, Metallica. He said, yeah, they're, they're playing The Stone tonight. We got to go check them out. And so we went down there, and literally there was like 15 people there. And I remember being at the front of the stage going, wow, these guys are, are pretty goddamn good. And there was a, there's a recording of that show. And in between songs, you can hear me scream, sweet savage. And, and Dave Mustaine walks up to the mic and says, fuck off. <laughs> but anyway, literally there was like 15 people at that show. A few months later, we got booked to play a Metal Monday. And it was Exodus's first show at Metal Monday at the Old Waldorf. And we got booked onto that show because we were friends with the headlining band, which was a band called Laws Rocket. And the band in the middle was Metallica. And we were like, oh, this is cool. We're going to be playing with Metallica. That's, that's great. And I remember we played that show. There was about, uh maybe about a hundred people in, in the club. And then Metallica went on and the place was packed. I don't know where the people came from, but all of a sudden they just showed up. Metallica played for like 45 minutes. And then when they get, went off stage, the place emptied, literally emptied. And there's like 30 people for Law's Rocket. And the next night was a benefit for Metal Mania magazine. And we got asked to play with Metallica again. And it was, um, it was a better situation because it was just us and Metallica. And uh, I met those guys for the first time uh, uh, in the dressing room of the Mubuhe Gardens, which was really wasn't much of a dressing room at all. It was like an indoor alley. That was just, the, you know, the beginning of, 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 of my relationship with them. And it's really funny because, you know, uh, like years after that, you know, uh, people would ask me, well, when's the first time you ever, you ever talked to those guys? And I would say, you know, I, I first met him at the MAB. And Lars is like, really? I don't remember that. And James is like, huh? Really? <laughs> they don't even remember. <laughs> Paul Bailoff was a very insightful <laughs> sort of personality. <laughs> he was really smart, all right? I'll say that first and foremost, he knew exactly what he was doing the whole time. And, you know, it was... It really was just like his way of like, like getting everyone together into the tribe and making sure that the tribe was was pure and and and, and its intentions were pure and and everyone was there for the right reasons and his way of weeding out all the all the people who who, who were not worthy was you know looking for visual signs like oh Motley Crue. They're posers. You must be a poser or, you know, whatever. What he really was doing, though, is, is that he was just making sure that everyone was just as metal as they possibly could be in his presence. It was entertaining to watch because uh, it was something that was that he saved exclusively for just, you know, the audience. He would never, like, walk up to any of the musicians and, and like, you know, pull that kind of shtick, you know, because I think he just knew that we probably knew better. But he would he would do it to the most like like unsuspecting person in the audience, single them out and go, "Hey, you're a fucking poser!" And like, dude, like dude, literally, like just like go over there and just like manhandle a person, tear off their shirt, rip it up, throw it in the audience, and uh, keep a piece for himself and like wrap it around his wrist or whatever, you know, take a trophy, you know. And there was never a dull moment with him, ever. Even like driving around with him. You know, I, I'd be, I'd get in his car, his dog, which is half wolf and half something else, would be in the back, you know, barking, moving around, and Bailoff would be talking, you know, he had road rage, so he would be like screaming at people outside of his window, you know, talking to me, you know, just driving, just like haphazardly. It was, 
it was just it was just very exciting being around him and and an adventure. I was just sitting there, and uh, it was April first, so I thought it was an April Fool's joke, and I had to say to the person on the other end, is this an April Fool's joke? And they said, no. They heard the Exodus demo, and they're very interested in, in, in uh, you flying out and, uh, and trying out for the band. I had a week to learn all the songs. And um, back then, you know, learning uh, eight or 10 songs in a week would have been pretty difficult. I could probably learn eight or 10 songs in, in like four days now because I'm just better at it. But back then, it was a lot. And I remember sitting down with that, that, that Metallica demo tape and just learning as much as I could and then flying out. And I remember when I arrived uh, to, to New York City and I arrived to the rehearsal spot in Jamaica, Queens at the music building and literally it was like 20 degrees outside and it was snowing. And that was a bit of a shock for me because I'd never left California <laughs> at that point. I remember getting there and it was like, early evening and those guys were just getting up and I thought who the fuck gets up at six or seven o'clock at night and I remember saying hello to them and 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 then like 15 minutes later going you know they were saying to me come on let's, let's just play some tunes and they said well what do you want to play and I instantly went for like you know the easiest song to play which is Seek and Destroy and uh, I remember playing Seek and Destroy with them and I couldn't understand why Lars and James kept on looking at each other and smiling. And I thought, wow, they must really enjoy this song. Or maybe there's something else going on that I don't know about. <laughs> but I later found out that it was because that they were just so happy that it sounded so good right from the start. I just started playing shows with them. <laughs> and then next thing you know, I'm in the studio with them. And, and, and recording Kill em All. And so I thought, well, I must be in the band if I'm recording an album with them now. Because they never sat me down and said, you're officially in the band. And they never did that. We only had three weeks and we had to rush through a lot of stuff. And there were, there's all sorts of mistakes on that album, but we couldn't really do anything about it. Everything was, uh, was pretty much uh, um, you know, scheduled, you know, this time for drums, you know drums and bass, this time for rhythm guitars, this time for lead guitars, this time for vocals, and, and you know, wherever you were at at the, at the end of that, the, that period of time, that's where you were at. <laughs> and so a lot of those guitar solos I wish I could do over, but you know, it's like, it was really just, okay, done, next one. Okay, done, next one. Okay, done, next one. But wait, I gotta fix some stuff. Nope, we gotta go to the next one. I mean, there's like, bad notes all over that album you know bands are kind of sh uh, shaky but you know when I think about it it's just like it gives it gives the album personality and it and and I I, I heard a track I think I heard Four Horsemen a couple days ago and I thought you know we were just going for it we were just happy to be there and we we're happy to be recorded we we had we had pretty pretty high standards of quality even back then, but we didn't have the resources to really do anything about it until the next album. And, and then, you know, that's why there's such a big difference in terms of like sound and production between Kill Em All and Ride the Lightning. Ride the Lightning represents everything that we wanted to do on Kill Em All but couldn't because of time restraints. And, um, and so that's why, you know, when you put them together, there's a, a, a big, Big difference, a lot of progress in terms of, of sound and, and performance. But you know, it was it was fun. We got drunk every night afterwards, <laughs> you know, kind of like just celebrating. And um, we didn't really know what the engineer was supposed to do. We had no idea what the producer was supposed to do. And, and so we were just kind of like, you know, taking it all in and taking notes. And um, you know, I would say that Kill Em All is, is imperfect, but that's what makes it perfect. This is imperfections. We were touring in less than favorable conditions, but it didn't matter because it was our first tour. And you know, just the fact that we were on tour and being able to like, like go from, from, from place to place, from city to city and play to different people every night was enough to keep us going, you know? I remember having a lot of problems with my guitar sound. <laughs> 
constantly having problems with my guitar sound. Because uh, the Marshalls we had, you know, I don't know what it was, but it, it seemed like every time I plugged into that the, 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 the Marshall I had back then, it just sounded different. And, you know, we couldn't, it was really hard for us to have consistent guitar sounds. Or James and I were always just like messing with our sounds in that, on that first tour. And, you know, it didn't help that we didn't have cases for any of the amps. You know, that stuff was just thrown in the back of a U-Haul. Um, and, and, and so we were constantly having problems. But, you know, it was all a learning experience as well. There were two bands stuck into a very small RV, us and Raven, and, there are, and our crews. <laughs> and so there was about, I would say, about 12 people in an RV. We had a blast on, on that, that, that first tour because we were doing what, we, what we've, we had what been the goal, you know, ever since we picked up our instruments, you know, go on tour, make, you know, make an album, go on tour and play music to, to, uh, for people who'd never, never uh, experienced us live before. And I remember when Kill 'Em All came out and I thought, you know, it'd be so wonderful if, if, if it was, if it's successful enough for us to like, you know, do a club tour from coast to coast. I thought, you know, if we can do that, then, then that's some real success. And I thought that, you know, that would be pretty much the extent of it. You know, we'd just be a club band <laughs> playing clubs because that's how we all started. And that's where that genre of music was sitting. It wasn't that popular. All you could do is play shows that were club shows because not a lot of people, there, well, there just wasn't an, audi uh, an audience yet for this kind of music. It was limited. You know, it was a lot of fun. And uh, I remember, um, you know, just I had to bring my guitar everywhere with me and I ha always had to have it within like two or three feet of me because I was paranoid of it being stolen. And on that, right before, no, right after that, the Kill Mall tour, we had an equipment truck stolen with like all our amps, all our cabinets and a few guitars, but none of the guitars were like, you know, are, are serious guitars, they're all backup guitars. And I was just so thankful that I, I you know, taking the time to, to always have my, my guitar and my guitar case close to me, whatever the situation. And actually I'm still like that to this day with that guitar. I mean, wherever I sleep, that guitar is probably in the same room with me. And so Ride the Lightning, it was, um, it was a very interesting album. We landed in, 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 in Copenhagen and uh, we were there to record, the, record an album. And uh, we had a limited budget and we had, uh, you know, worked out, you know, only so much time. And uh, when it looked like we needed to be there longer, we worked out a deal with the studio, but we didn't have any place to live, you know? And so we actually ended up living upstairs in like the storage room where they kept all the tapes, you know? So there'd be a, pl there'd be a space on the floor and literally fucking three sleeping bags and then shelves of like, you know, master tapes. I say it's three sleeping bags because Lars, him being from Copenhagen, always had a place to crash. But Cliff, James and I, we were sleeping on the floor. But you know, the thing, the thing with the Ride the Lightning is we were just kind of like, we knew we had more time to, to explore certain guitar sounds and we knew that having the right drum sound was was key to having a good sounding album. I mean, all good, great sounding albums sound with great drum sounds. And we knew that. And we knew Sweet Silence had a reputation for, for just it being a great sounding studio. Also, back then, uh, studios were a lot, uh, uh, um, lot cheaper to record in uh, co uh, compared to American studios. And, you know, it was Copenhagen, you know, Lars's home country, blah, blah, blah. We just thought it was a, a good thing to be, you know, to be away from the Bay Area. 
Uh, but what we did not know is that we were going to be away for so long. And we ended up being away for like five or six months. And we all got incredibly homesick. I mean, incredibly homesick. I remember a lot of those those feelings uh, that are around the lyrics of Fade to Black had a lot to do with just feeling homesick. Because um, we were all, all just pining for home. <laughs> I remember, you know, being kind of, you know, depressed, wanting to be home, came time to do my solos. And I remember just like, fuck, you know, I have all this energy, but I'm just, I'm like bummed out at the same time. And so I just kind of put the, all those, all those feelings into my guitar, guitar solos. And, and that was therapy. Cliff, he was the only one who actually like, you know, uh, studied um, um, uh, uh, musical theory in, in earnest. I mean, I I, I studied, studied music music theory, but Cliff went to school and studied it for like a couple years. And so he had a, a, a much firmer grasp of, of musical theory and harmonies. He was really, really good at teaching us how, how to harmonize guitars and whatnot. I mean, my own my only experience with, with, with harmony guitars is like Thin Lizzy songs. And even then, you know, I'd only play one guitar part, you know. But but uh but Cliff, he just who's really into harmonizing everything. And he would like come up with bass parts and harmonize the bass parts. He played a lot of guitar, he he'd come up with guitar parts and harmonize guitar parts. He was just really, really into harmony. So who's your main influences there, Cliff? Main influences, yeah. Geezer Butler, Getty Lee, Stanley Clark, Tony Iommi, Richie Blackmore. You don't like English. Ed King, old guitar player for Leonard Skinner. He's fucking bad as shit. What? I just swore a few times. I guess I wasn't supposed to do that. Man. And so I remember I was working out guitar so solos for Ride the Lightning. And I thought, oh, I'm going to harmonize this, this piece in this solo. And I remember thinking, okay, if I do it myself, it's going to take hours. But if I get Cliff over here, it's going to take 15 minutes. And, you know, he's just like, he said, right, write out all the, all the notes. And I was like, okay, E, you know, G. G sharp, B, and he go, okay, E, we're gonna go to the fourth, which is A, okay, G, we're gonna go to the fifth, which is C. You know, he'd do that kind of thing and just do it all on paper. And then he'd say, okay, then let's get our guitars and see how it sounds, you know? And nine times out of 10, it would sound correct. <laughs> and I, I would be so blown away. And so there was a, po a point during Ride the Lightning that Cliff left to go back home and we were all so jealous because his parents sent him a ticket, and none of us had that kind of resource, you know, to do that. And so there was a time during the Ride the Lightning sessions where it was just James, Lars, and myself. And I remember James wanted to, 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 uh, to uh, work out. It's not really a harmony. It's like a, 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 a alternate part in For Whom the Bell Tolls. And uh, it's kind of based on harmonies. And I remember him and I trying to work it out and we fucking couldn't work it out. And him just like being frustrated and going, fuck, I wish Cliff was here. And, but we, it took a few days, but <laughs> eventually he worked it out. <laughs> it just goes to show, I mean, he, he, he had such a, a great grasp on, on music theory and you know, uh, his approach to harmonies and everything, you know, harmonic rubbed off on us a lot. And then once he left, I remember thinking, oh, shoots, you know, we've lost like a, a, a huge, like a, a, a source of, of mu musical knowledge, you know, and, and, and technique and theory. And I remember thinking, shoots, you know, who's going to fill that gap? And I remember like, just like freaking out and then buying a bunch of music books and just just <laughs> just uh, brushing up on my own own musical knowledge and theory and so i mean that that was pretty much uh, you know his biggest sort of uh of a uh, contribution in, in terms of like you know inspiring us and influencing us other than his raw riffs back then we were just, we had so much energy 
And a lot of it was just nervous energy. You know, I remember whenever we would play a big festival like that, we'd all be a bit nervous, you know, and you, some of us would, you know, have a couple beers, you know, to kind of take the edge off. But that nervous energy, I think, contributed a lot to the beats per minute. If you came here to see spandex and uh, fucking eye makeup and all that shit and the words rock and roll baby in every fucking song, this ain't the fucking band. We came here to bash some fucking heads for 50 minutes. Are you fucking with us? I hate you with more to say. Fact of the matter is, is that back then we were we all were just we were just all so just energetic naturally we all just had so much energy and we just needed a place to like get it all out and the music was was where we all 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 came out. I remember when we were getting the song Master Puppets together, and I just couldn't believe it. I mean, it's just everything just kind of flowed into. Every riff flowed into every other riff. And, you know, the only thing that was uh, 100% realized with that song was the, the opening riff, you know, the main riff. Everything kind of like just came after it. Like in the verse parts I had, you know, this is uh, based off some riffs I had, but they weren't exact, they didn't sound like that. And the pre-chorus part, you know, uh, uh, before the, the chorus is another thing that I had, but it didn't sound quite like that. Um, the chorus was something that James had, but it didn't quite sound like that. Master, master, master of puppets, I'm pulling the strings. Twisting your mind and smashing your dreams. Blinding my knee, you can't see a thing. Just come the name, cause I'll hear you scream. Oh, master, master. So... It, it, it was uh, when everything came together, that riff kind of like set the tone for all these riffs to be changed to, be, to become that song. And so we didn't know that the, the, the finished product was going to sound like that for that particular song. All we had was a riff. By the time that uh, that song was done, we were like, wow, this is fantastic, much better than any of us thought. And that was really consistent from song to song. I mean, Disposable Heroes, I remember showing up, you know, we were jamming on it. Um, uh, you know, the very fast part was a, a riff I had I, I, that we had been jamming on for like months before. At least Lars and I, we, we would jam on the fast part, you know, just, just casually. But when that song was coming along, you know, the feeling that it was special started to hit me. And I remember I, I got a lump in my throat. And that lump started showing up on a, a regular basis. Every time I'd show up at rehearsal and it came time to, to, to uh, play another song, I'd get this lump in my throat. I was like, wow, you know, I'm, re I'm physically reacting to this song on a subconscious level. That's what that tells me, you know, because I'm just, I'm just working on, you know, uh, the, the, the logistics of the song. But, you know, something inside of me is, uh, is being affected, too, uh, from an emotional sort of, uh, of uh, uh, a standpoint. Same thing happened when we were working on Sanitarium. I was just like, oh, lump in my throat again. Orion was the middle part of Sanitarium until it was decided that, that, that it was going to be its own thing. And so then Orion became its own thing and Sanitarium became, it, became its own thing. Uh, at one point, um, we were deba debating whether Sanitarium needed a chorus or lyrics over the chorus part or not. Of course, lyrics came over that chorus. Most of the material was written. There was only a couple songs that were not done by the time we got to Sweet Silence. That was the thing that should not be. Um, but the basic riffs were there, which just needed to be finished and also Damage Incorporated. Again, the basic riffs were there, just needed to be finished. And those were finished just really quickly in the studio. Those two songs went, 
were just when they were done, they were done. <laughs> there were there weren't any like major changes or any, anything like that to it. And I can remember thinking with the thing that should not be. It was in 1986. Hardly anyone tuned down, but we wanted to tune down because of Sabbath, you know, Into the Void, that kind of thing. Not only did we tune down, but we tuned down a half step more than usual which was, you know, everyone back then, or Sabbath, we only tuned down to D. We tuned down to C sharp thinking that, you know, we're that much more clever. It's going to be that much more heavy. It turned out heavy. Much more heavy? I don't know, but it turned out pretty, pretty, pretty heavy. That's that's one of the standout tracks. The thing that should should not be. Um, I think it's a really really unusual uh, type of song. And at, at the time, there wasn't very many songs like that. In fact, you can look at all the songs on Master of Puppets and say there aren't any any songs like this contemporarily right now. And I think that's why it became such a successful album is that we presented a palette of colors that no one had ever ever seen before or you know or tasted before and to this day if you're not, you're you're not um you're not hip to like heavy metal culture or, or you know the sound of heavy metal and you get that album it's like a blueprint for 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 you know so many albums to come afterward but you know a, a, it's it's such a, a a unique album, and everything, everything that 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 we knew at that point, all our skills, all our knowledge, all our creativity, all our inspirations, all our influence were poured into that album. It was it was great. It was really intimidating for me because you know I I held Black Sabbath at such you know high fucking standards. You know, it's just like you know. To me, the, at that point, Black Sabbath were, were the ultimate, you know, and, and even to this day, you know, I, I still feel that. And to be touring with the lead singer of, you know, the former lead singer of Black Sabbath was just a huge thing. And, you know, being a huge Randy Rhodes fan and Blizzard of Oz fan too, that, that definitely played into it. But, you know, for Cliff, it really, really meant, I think, more to him than anyone else. And all he could talk about the entire time was Black Sabbath. And, you know, during sound check, he was always playing Sabbath riffs in the hopes that he'd get Ozzy's uh, attention, you know? And I remember one time, what were we playing? Maybe Hole in the Sky or maybe Symptoms of the Universe or something during sound check. And all of a sudden, you know, all his, out in front of the stage, there's Ozzy, like big old smiles going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, oh my God, we just like, it was, it was amazing for us to like be acknowledged by Ozzy during that sound check. And I remember looking over at Cliff, and Cliff just had the biggest smile. It's just like, and he, whenever he was happy, he'd do the slow motion walk. You know, he just like do the slow motion walk. But um, whenever he could, he'd always mention Black Sabbath to Ozzy, and he would always try to get Ozzy to talk about Sabbath. And Ozzy was always like, you know, happy to talk about Sabbath. And so Cliff and Ozzy, they had quite a few conversations. There's one time where we were, uh, our bus stopped at a truck stop and Ozzy's bus stopped at a truck stop. And we were told by Sharon the entire time, uh, can't drink around Ozzy, can't drink, you know? If you're gonna drink, pour it in the solo cup, but don't give him any booze. Don't be seen drinking around him. Just like none of that. And we're like. Fine, Sharon. And we were, we were really good soul cups, you know. Uh, we were really like paying attention to that. So we stopped, you know, both both uh, buses stop at a truck stop, and everyone on our bus gets off except for Cliff. Everyone on Ozzy's bus gets off ex instead of Ozzy, except for Ozzy. Ozzy gets off his bus and walks over to our bus and goes onto our bus and sees Cliff. And the first thing he says to Cliff is, Got any beer? <laughs> and Cliff's like, yeah, that's 
right there. Help yourself. <laughs> and so after about 20 minutes, all of us go on and there's Ozzy on our bus and he's drinking. And I'm like, holy shit, what are we going to do? We did not know what to do. We were like, we were like whispering, going, what we, he's drinking. What are we going to do? And we had no idea what we were going to do. I remember at one point, our tour manager went off the bus, went onto Ozzy's bus, grabbed their tour manager and said, we're in a real situation here. We got to get Ozzy off our bus. <laughs> and so after about 10 minutes, tour, their tour manager came on and said, Oz, we're about to leave. And Oz was like, oh, well, I'll ride with them. <laughs> and the tour manager was going, Ozzy, we need to ride, we need to be together. And Ozzy left. And it was a bit of a situation because we thought that, you know, that that all that the whole thing that just went down might have gotten us kicked off the tour. And, you know, there are actually a couple of situations where we thought we were going to get kicked off the tour, but we weren't. It was our first arena tour. So, I mean, we and this was like, you know, a conversation that we would have nightly and go out there and fucking play our asses off as heavy and as hard and as energetic as we could and just fucking just headbang as hard as you can and just like go out there and give it a thousand percent, you know, because it's our first arena tour. We wanted to make a, 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 you know, a maximum impact. So that was the attitude every single fucking night. And, you know, in retrospect, I think, <laughs> I think we pulled it off because I remember seeing an interview with Ozzy uh, you know, like two or three years later, and he said, yeah, when Metallica were on tour, they blew us off every night. I was just going, geez, I'm seeing this in the magazine going, yeesh, that's, you know, that's that's quite a lot for something like someone like Ozzy to say, because, I mean, my experience is we went out, we played as, as much as we could, and then we'd, we'd get off stage and we'd watch Ozzy's show, and Ozzy, every night, looked like he went down like he was just like, you know, master of the universe. <laughs> and for him to, to think that we blew him off stage after him watching him go down every night, it really made an impression on me because I could tell that, you know, he was judging us not on fucking, you know, audience, audience uh, standards, but on musical standards, you know, and, 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 and like, you know, real, like, like creative standards. And, you know, it really meant a lot to me. WRTN and Nurse Yellow Home of Midnight Metal, of course, tonight uh, dedicating the entire show to uh, Cliff Burton of Metallica, who uh, died uh, early this Saturday morning in a tragic uh, auto accident. Uh, the tour bus of Metallica going off the road uh, during their tour in Sweden. It was early this Saturday morning that uh, it happened. Uh, Metallica's minivan or tour bus, whatever you want to call it, was uh, on way to Copenhagen from a gig in Sweden. And uh, as we have learned, the uh, driver of the bus fell asleep and uh, uh, causing the uh, van or tour bus to go off the road, James Kirk and Lars uh, had abrasions. Uh, as of now, Anthrax and Metallica are in Copenhagen, Denmark, in a hotel together, and we're gonna bring you the latest on this tragic incident. The last show that we played with Cliff was a spectacular show because it was after it was the first show after maybe six or seven weeks that James was finally back on on guitar because he had broken his arm during the Aussie tour and his arm had healed enough so that he was actually able to play guitar. And it was the first show where we had James back and it was the night that Cliff died. So everyone, Cliff, James, Lars and myself, we were just so happy that James is back and to have James's guitar, you know, fucking fueling everything again you know, rather than me and John Marshall sharing that duty, we played really, really well and felt that, you know, we were back 100%. Everyone was so inspired and we played that show so well because we had not played like that in 
four to four or six weeks or, or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, that, that last show was like one of the best shows we had played all fucking year. And, you know, in retrospect, I'm glad that, that, that we, you know, Cliff's last show was special in that regards. It really was, in, 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 in all respects, you know, one of the best shows we had played. And Cliff was very, very happy. And so knowing that is just, just a good thing. Yeah, you know, Cliff and I, we used to, uh, we used to uh, room together, so we were super close. We were like brothers. So we would, we'd hang out, we'd fucking like, hang out, you know, arms around each other. But literally, like ten minutes later, we could be arguing and fucking wrestling on the ground. You know, that's the kind of relationship we had. Total, hundred percent honest. You know, uh, emotions just out there all the time. Cliff would say this so much. He would say, there's power in the truth. There's power in the truth. There's power in the truth. You have to be honest all the time. You know, you have problems with me. I want you to tell me, blah, blah, blah. You know, and I would tell him, you know, he would tell me, and then he'd like suggest ridiculous things like, okay, let's wrestle or fisticuffs or, you know, you know, uh, the drinking contest, you know, or you got to show me this lick, you know, or, or whatever. But, um, there was two weeks where it was, it was just like a yo-yo. But you know, Jan Burton, Cliff's mom, was there and she was around us a lot, as was Ray Burton. And they kept on insisting, insisting, insisting that we go on. And we were like, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it really didn't really truly sink in until like maybe about, I don't know, three weeks or so. And we were just kind of like looking at each other going, well, what's gonna happen now? We have to keep, we have to continue. Cliff would have wanted us to continue. And as a tribute to Cliff's memory, it was important for us to go on. And so those first two weeks, it was like, it was up and down. We had no idea what was going on. I mean, I was thinking, what am I going to do? I was thinking guitar lessons, you know, <laughs> the old standby for musicians. You can't find, you know, any gigs or a band, you know, you give guitar lessons, you know. The old standby. That's what I was actually thinking, uh, but uh, but it was the insistence of Ray and Jan Burton that I think really just pushed us in, in, into into the decision to keep on going. And then w when when Jason came into band, it, it was only like four or five weeks a a after the accident. I mean, we were still grieving, and you know, we were all pretty young too. We were in our mid twenties. And we didn't really have, or at least I didn't have a lot of experience with grieving and, and knowing how to deal with that and knowing how to heal and how to move on. And so I, I, I hate to say it, but, you know, Jason was, was, became the scapegoat for all those feelings that we just did not know how to process. And, you know, to this day, I, I regret, I, I regret behaving like that and then taking that attitude. But I mean, we didn't really know better. And, you know, as far as the grieving period is concerned, I think, I think, I think we're all still kind of grieving, you know? Uh, Cause I get emotional when I think about Cliff and when we're together, think about Cliff, you know, a lot, we, I know that James and I, we get really, really emotional. Um, and, and so, I mean, I would say for me, you know, there's still some grief after all these years, you know, it's just like, after all these years, I can still feel that, that pain. You know, in, in the late eighties, uh, uh, the, the music culture kind of like, kind of steered itself towards, uh, you know, musical proficiency and how proficient you were with your, 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 your instrument and how virtuosic you can be, you know, with, uh, with your technique. And there was a lot of, lot of emphasis on that kind of thing, you know, and there was a lot of like instrumental albums being put out by a lot of guitar players. They were super, super um, uh, successful. And, uh, 
you know, the showy bit of, of, of being in a band was kind of like, I think, augmented by, by things like MTV and, and just being able to play your instrument. So I think that had a, a, a bit of an a, of a influence on us in, in terms of like uh, wanting to show people, how, you know, what we could do um, and how progressive we can be. Because after an album like Master of Puppets, you know, we thought, wow, this is, this is as technical as it gets, you know? And at that point in our, our musicality, it was about as, as technical as we could get. But we wanted to show people that we can even go farther. And so conceptually, that was, that was uh, what we were thinking, you know, in the songwriting. And, you know, the riffs, they just, after, touring on the Aussie tour and then playing all those headline shows. Uh, uh, we had started like really like uh, taking advantage uh, uh, of, of the fact that, you know, when you're on tour, your playing is uh, is uh, like, you know, really, really, you know, the level of, of ability is really high, you know, playing at 100% and all of a sudden all these riffs start coming out, you know, and we were experiencing that pretty much for the first time, writing riffs on tour because it just, it just it's just what happens after a while. And so a lot of the riffs that ended up on, on Justice for All were riffs that were written on Master of Puppets. And you know, the technicality of, of what we were doing in Master of Puppets, uh, you know, wanting to take that further, uh, influenced how those riffs were written. So when it came to a time to, to get all, all, all the music together for Injustice for All, we had a bevy of, of riffs that were just that much more thought out and developed and more progressive because you know we had we had the ability to be more progressive so we just took that and ran with it we knew because we had a relationship with mtv we knew when they were, were planning on playing the video we said yeah we'll play it you know twice an hour so six o'clock hour six o'clock we're gonna play it twice an hour hour eight o'clock we're gonna play it twice an hour, blah 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 so we actually knew in advance what was gonna come on. And I remember, okay, I can catch it, you know? And I remember watching it. And then afterwards, the VJ said, oh, man, whew, that was depressing. Okay, now on to better things. And instantly I thought, we have something. <laughs> if that was the reaction of the VJ, <laughs> and there's nothing, there was no videos like that on MTV at that point that was like the one video with, with dialogue. I thought we're on to something. We are on to something here. I always knew the song was great, but you know, you can think a song is great, but you know, the audience will, you know, for some reason or another think otherwise. Um, but you know, I just knew from the reaction of that VJ that that uh we had something that was actually hitting people on an emotional level. <laughs> You know, a, a lot of times, you know, we go out there and, you know, first song, Creeping Death, you know, play it. And, you know, habitually we go, come on, everyone, you know, do this, sing, sing, you know? Well, that day, <laughs> when we went out there and we we're going, sing, sing, the audience interpret that as, these the bleachers <laughs> flood the, the entire uh, empty uh, 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 football field in front of, uh, of the stage and come to the front of the stage and just <laughs> come come closer to us. That's as that's what it was interpreted as. But we we're just going sing. <laughs> and so like during that song, we it was like a dam busted and flowing out like water was just thousands of bodies out into the empty playing field and 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 right up right up to the stage there were there were rows of like collapsible chairs that were just sitting there and the audience just mauled them over and 
And there are people picking up the chairs and throwing them forward, which is the only way you, you, you can get rid of them, which is towards the stage. So we're trying to play, and all these chairs are like flying, and they're hitting people up front, and, and they're landing in, in, in the security uh, 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 barrier and the space between. And it was like total chaos for like 10 to 15 minutes. And at one point, we had to stop playing because we were concerned that you know, mass hysteria might break out and people might start getting hurt. So we sat there on stage, and sat down, and people just kept on throwing stuff. <laughs> and at this point, they were throwing anything to get their hands on. And then when it subsided, we are like, right, let's get back to playing. And we played again, and it was fine. But for 10 minutes, it really looked like the worst sort of mass hysteria and chaos you can ever think of. Thousands of bodies just... just flowing out, you know, w with no, no, no order whatsoever, you know, and just filling space. It's a scary thing to see, but at the same time, it was incredibly awesome. And I never used that word, but it was. I hung out with George Lynch a lot. <laughs> I hung out with, with George Lynch a lot. And, um, you know, him and I would just uh, play guitar, but I was mostly just watching him play. And, you know, there was a few times where I would hang out with Eddie. But Eddie was, it was funny, you know, we would talk. And I, you know, I'd want him to, like, play guitar. But he, all he wanted to do was talk, you know, and talk about equipment and, and, you know, guitars and stuff. And I always wanted to, like, actually play. But he always wanted to just talk, which was a little frustrating to me, you know, for and for me. And, like, the Scorpions, they're, they're, uh, Always, they were always kind of like you know off to their off to their own, and to like you know socialize with them, you'd have to like walk into their camp and like, hey, what's up? But you know, I liked them so much that it was hard for me to stay away from them, and so I was I was always talking to Rudolph and and and, and uh, Matthias because those guys were like really you know the easiest guys to approach, and you know it it was a pretty cool tour I have to say in, in terms of like guitar players and guitar playing, and I watched Eddie as much as I could, and to this day I still don't understand where he comes up with ninety percent of his licks because they're like <laughs> I, I don't I don't hear any other people playing those licks he you know he just creates it all himself. <laughs> He came down to uh, to rehearsals uh, for the Black Album, and his one one thing was he said to us, "No one has ever caught the power and energy of you guys live on tape or on vinyl." And I thought about it, and I thought he has a point. You know, there is yet to be a, a recorded uh, 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 um, a, a song that captures, you know. The energy and and and, uh, and uh, the um, uh, the um, the urgency <laughs> that that you know comes with uh, with seeing this live, and that was his goal. And you know, to a certain extent, looking back at the albums that that uh, he did do, I mean, he caught a lot of energy uh, in the studio. I mean. His whole way of, of, of recording us was so radically different than anything we'd ever done. And, uh, you know, all, all of us playing together in the same room to record the drums was a milestone for us because uh, in the past it was just James. And, you know, we, we honestly thought that whenever we were all playing together like that in the room, that Lars always played better. And, you know, that using that recording technique proved th that that was the case. And so the first time I heard it on the radio, I was blown away about how good it sounded, you know? Because, like, you know, one sounded pretty good on the radio. It sounded pretty good on, on MTV, you know, even though it's compressed to shit. But the, there was something about the Black Album and all the tracks that just made it leap out of the radio. Maybe it's because there's so much presence in the drums, you know? You know, the, the drums are so crisp. I, you know, I don't know, but every track that's played on the radio, it just like leaps out of the radio. It, there's just so much presence. And, uh, and, and you, to me, I mean, that's the thing that I keep on going back to is just how good it sounds when I hear it on the radio. And, you know, it, I, I just, it never struck me as being a hit song, <laughs> you know? 
none of those songs ever struck me as being hit songs. They struck me as being just like really, really good, concise songs with great, great periods of heaviness and great periods of, of melody. And when the album just started, you know, selling the way it did, I could not believe it. And I even had a bet. I had a bet with our tour manager. He said, yeah, six million. It's going to sell six million by, by this date. And I was like, I'll give you my Porsche 911 Carrera if that happens. And guess what? It happened. And guess what? I had to give him my Porsche 911 Carrera. You know, for, for me, I think Bob... He's, he's an um, amazing producer, and he's also an amazing engineer, and he has an amazing ear for guitar sounds, for drum sounds. Some of the best guitar sounds that I have ever gotten, ever in my life, I've gotten with Bob Rock. And a, a lot of it is just like, you know, chasing tones, blending amps, you know, using certain amps with certain pickups, certain guitars with certain amps, you know, the various combinations blending amps, blending guitars. What I like about Bob Rock is that is that he is into the pursuit. <laughs> you know, if he hears something, a sound or performance, he will pursue that or make you pursue it until he believes you've reached that point. And um, a lot of times it's a lot of frus frustration, you know, and you know, there's a lot of footage <laughs> that shows him being just like so frustrated going, it's not there yet. It's not there yet. Do it, push, push, do it. And he'll, he would do anything, say anything <laughs> to just push us to that next level. It's like he's got to fucking eat, sleep and breathe this fucking solo until it's done. Like fucking James put time into nothing. Songs like these deserve that. It doesn't need fucking flash. It's not his style. He's, he's got to put some time into this one. Gotta he's work. not going to work on it. Oh, so just let's slap on anything. That's what you're saying. No. So what do you suggest? It's like crackle, boom, da da do do, da da do do. You know, it's fucking. One, two, I guess what I'm just trying to say, he starts up there and then goes down, and all the shit you said right there is great shit, but I don't see it being any less great if it comes in in bar two instead of in bar one. But what I'm saying is build rather than blow your load, bring everybody down, and then build it up again. I'm just saying let's fucking get guttural and build it to a peak, because that's why there's the strings and all those changes at the end. Why can't it start here and go like that? Yeah. Uh, that's that's my my school of thought. Grab them and like take them to this other place and then really take them to a, a higher plateau. Fuck man, sound you wage. Go ahead. You got Go ahead. To Impress me. Mm -hmm. God's permission. Do whatever you want, Kurt. And I you, have to. you agree with him? Go for it, man. Well, come on, let's cut the shit and start working. Cut to the chase and fucking play, okay? All right, man. Now that you've, uh, you know, warmed up. I liked, I liked that approach, and it was really effective at the time. Um, because, you know, at that point, I, I, I didn't feel like I, I just, I, I knew my full potential. And Bob Rock really helped me just, like, kind of see my own potential over the course of, of, of all the albums that that it, that we recorded with them, Bob's really really good at, at, at just steering the entire project along and keeping everything in place so nothing like veers too much this way or veers off too much that way. He keeps everyone very very focused and and, uh, and all the all the goals in sight. And um, you know I I I think he's just a a great great producer. It was a three-year tour, and it, 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 we started in 1991 and ended uh, uh, in, I think, the summer of 94. That, that tour is very special because, I mean, when you put out a tour and put in an album, you're guaranteed you can go to A markets, which is like, you know, all the usual big cities, Chicago, San Francisco, L.A., New York, you know. that Those, those are A markets. The B markets are like, um, you know, Oakland, uh, Pasadena, you know, New Jersey, uh, you know, that, you know, that kind of thing. But if your album is really good, then you can hit up the C markets 
And because the album's selling and it's a good barometer of who's buying in the, these records, you know, you can go into the C markets and, and, and know that you'll sell tickets because, you know, the album is doing so well just everywhere. That, you know, there's kind of like a, a built-in audience. So we were going to places like, you know, Butte, Montana, and Val du Lakes, fucking in uh, Minnesota, places I'd never even heard of. And we were showing up and, and the shows were selling out. The expanse of the Black Album was, was amazing. The expanse uh, uh, and, uh, and the reach of it over the course of the tour is amazing because we were able to get into the nooks and crannies uh, of, of America and play to places that normally, you know, bands would not go because they wouldn't be, they had not sold, sold records in, in those areas, but we had at that point. And so, you know, it was really important for us. And now, and to these days, those markets are still very strong Metallica markets. And it's because we went there during the Black Album. Well, the pressure is, is for me to like, you know, to not, not do the same thing twice, you know? And so every album I try to like, to like uh, not repeat myself. Um, and, you know, I know you guitar players know what I'm talking about. We all have our bag of tricks, you know. <laughs> once those, once we went been through those bag of tricks, we're just kind of like staring at the floor, going, "Oh, now what do I do?" <laughs> and I wanted to like be free of that sort of thing. And my way out of that is to just fully and completely improvise and to completely work on my improv improvisation. And you know, I realized this in the '90s, so I started listening to a lot more blues and a lot more jazz and just a lot more improvisational music in general. And, and you know, my, so, so my whole attitude now is if I improvise and I just make up stuff right on the spot, that's a real, real honest way for me to just like really show what I'm feeling and, and what my, my guitar uh, capabilities are in, in the moment. I never know what the heck my guitar solos are going to be on, on certain songs live because I leave it open. You know, fade to black solo. I know that the first seven or eight bars are going to be what I always play, but I don't have any idea what I'm going to play after that. And there's a lot of songs in Metallica's set that are now like that, that never used to be. My point is, is that, you know, being, being, uh, being recognized and, and getting so much attention from so many other guitar players all over the world, yeah, I feel the pressure of that, you know, and I feel the expectations of that, but I'm not going to let it affect the outcome of my own musicality. I, I started playing guitar because I have a curiosity, real curiosity for music and how music works. And I also have, you know, emotions and feelings in me that even to this day, I that, that need to get out, you know. What's important is to make music that reflects your inner self and is honestly not anything that that that's that's been done before, and that's a it's difficult, but it, you know it's a challenge that I like because I can wake up every day to that challenge, you know it gets me out of bed, and it gets me to, to walking over to my instrument and going, what can I squeeze out of this out of this thing now that's different that no one else has heard ever before? Looking back now, I play guitar for over forty years now. I should be way better. But <laughs> but looking back, the most important thing is practice. And the most important thing is also 100% commitment. You really have to play as much as you can and you really have to be really focused on what you want to do. For me, it's like maybe after like six or seven months of me playing guitar, I turned, I turned a point where I was like, I need this in my life. You know, this is so important for me. I don't think I, I don't think that there's anything else that's that's more important, you know, other than the other things like you know, family, friends, health, whatever. I don't think there's anything else that's this important to me in my life. And I held on to it like a fucking lifeline. The greatest thing that happened to me is like I play guitar literally 12 hours a day when I was a kid, and I reached you know I reached a point where I was just like. I know that I can do something. I know I can make a, 
uh, some sort of living out of it, whether it's becoming a guitar teacher, being in a band, you know, something. I know that, you know, I can make music a, a part of my life. And I just stuck to it and I kept my eyes and ears open for opportunities. And I also learned how to hustle to make work for myself ever since the very beginning, you know, hey, I'm playing with you and I'm playing with you and we're going to form a band, we're going to play shows and make money. I've always had a real good sense of, of, of having, knowing how to sell the band, sell my music and sell my musical abilities. If anyone tells you that you can, you can be successful with, without being a, a, a thousand percent committed and it being a lifestyle, they're lying to you. It, it has to be a lifestyle. If you, know, you wanna become a guitar player but you have other things in your life, that's great. But really, to really, really get where you want to be, it's a lifestyle. Look at all the other successful guitar players in the world. It's a lifestyle for them. I practice every fucking day. People still ask me, why, why do you practice? I'm like, are you kidding? About 10 years ago, something happened and I something switched. And, you know, I used to uh, get so bored when I was doing tedious things with my guitar, you know, like showing something, so, showing someone something or, a company, or doing like tedious recording or rehearsal, whatever. But 10 years ago, something shifted and I enjoy everything now. I enjoy everything. None of it is work. None of it is work, except for one thing. There's one thing about my career that's work. And that's the change in my sleeping patterns. <laughs> that is the one thing that just messes with me. Everything else I embrace wholeheartedly a thousand percent, you know, whether it's rehearsal, the travel, the sitting down, working out harmonies, you know, recording, you know, taking three days to come up with the guitar sound, you know, can't finish a song. Sometimes it takes six months to finish a song, you know, it's all part of it, and I enjoy all of it. And, you know, I constantly uh, uh, rejoice in the fact that I, I am staying true to playing guitar rather than working guitar. And for me, it's such a, like, it's such a big difference. I always, you know, I'm playing my guitar. I'm not working my guitar. I'm not struggling my guitar. I'm playing my guitar, and I'm having a good time. And this is play. And it just also happens to be, you know, my life commitment and how I make a living. And, you know, I'd be doing this right now if, it, you know, if I wasn't in Metallica. And I'd probably be, you know, I don't know, like I said, a guitar teacher or something, you know. But I would definitely have the same commitments because for me, it's just like guitar playing helps me so much. It saved my life. It, it calms down this thing that's inside of me and it gives me focus and it gives me reason to like get up out of bed i don't i hope this doesn't sound too far far-fetched or or, or 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 whimsical but you know classical music has, has survived six seven hundred years um even longer but they can't really document it um you know i really believe that 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 uh that heavy metal will probably outlast this century and maybe, you know, outlast us. And I don't know what the world's going to be like in the future, but, you know, as long as there's, there's a need for aggressive, energetic music that's, you know, somewhat therapeutic, you know, I think that, that, that there will be musicologists in, in the future that are going to find our music and, you know, and, and you know, find some merit and, and quality in it, you know. And that's, that's huge.